folks. I'm Peter Hauerstein. I am the president of AI Tampa Bay, and I would like to welcome you to our third annual Voice of Architecture Economic Outlook Panel discussion. I'd like to give a special thanks to our program sponsor, Hancock Whitney Bank. I'd also like to thank Dewey Carruthers with Dewey and Associates for working with us on this program. Also, thanks to Kyle Parks, who will moderate the program with us. In case you don't know Kyle, he is a principal at B2 Communications. They are a St. Petersburg-based agency that helps a wide variety of clients with everything from content creation and media relations to crisis communication and counseling. He is a former journalist turned corporate PR marketing executive who co-founded B2 11 years ago. B2 does a lot of work in the real estate and development space with involvement in Urban Land Institute, and work for clients like Colliers International, Metro Development, Playstar Architecture, and AIA Tampa Bay. So thank you, Kyle. Thanks. Um, yeah. Today we have four distinguished panelists uh, to expand on the data that we collected on our survey. And first we have uh, Jason Jensen. Jason is the president and CEO of WJ Architects, an interdisciplinary architecture firm in St. Petersburg that specializes in municipal, and community-focused projects. A University of Florida graduate, Jason began his career in New York before returning here to St. Pete with the goal of promoting innovative architecture design across Florida. We also with have, us, have with us Keith Greminger. Keith is a Florida registered architect and serves as principal of urban planning and design in the Tampa office for Stantec. He has 39 years of practice serving Various, and serving various roles in architecture, urban design, and community planning with local and nationally recognized firms such as Kimmy Horn, Gensler, URS, which is now AECOM. Uh, Keith graduated with a Bachelor of Architecture from Kansas State University with an emphasis on placemaking through planning and urban design. Also with us is Nicole Popovics. Uh, she is the Vice President of Leasing at the Sampler Company. The Sampler Company is a full service commercial real estate firm with a portfolio of nearly 10 million square feet under leasing and management in the Southeast. Nicole has more than 15 years of retail leasing experience. So she brings with her a bachelor's degree in business real estate from Florida State University. Thanks for joining us, Nicole. And last but certainly not least, we have Tim Coop. He's the regional president of Tampa Bay for Hancock Whitney Bank. Uh, Tim's responsible for all lines of business in the greater Tampa Bay region. His banking career includes more than 30 years in commercial and corporate banking, and he holds a Bachelor of Science in Business Administration Finance with Honors from the University of Florida. So I want to thank all of you for joining us. Um, and before we start and turning it over to Kyle, I'd also like to ask if you do have questions, please put them in the chat box during, during the uh, panel and we'll be sure to get to them one by one. So Kyle, I'm gonna give it over to you now. Thank you, Peter, appreciate it. And thanks everybody for taking the time tonight to hear what our panel has to say about the future. I um, thought I'd start by just giving three or four big highlights from our survey. Um, it's interesting because this is the third year, as Peter mentioned, for us to do the survey. And last year it was, as you all know, that was done right before the pandemic, but very interesting in terms of that continued strong outlook continues to be the theme for the 104 architects who responded. 70% uh, of the respondents said they expect demand for architecture services to increase this year. Also healthcare, commercial offices and aviation were hurt, but on the other side, uh, there were a lot of industries like industrial, notably, that did gr are doing great. Um, also, more than half of the architects said that they expect their organization to hire more people this year, and a whopping 87% expect the revenue to grow. And what we're going to talk about tonight is a, a few different ways to look at these results. But one thing that I talked to the panel the other day in a prep call really struck me and also very, as I, Peter mentioned, I'm very involved in the Urban Land Institute. We've had two, now two major looks at what's going on around the country with the beginning of the year. Uh, the ULI report that comes out every year, which really talked about companies and people leaving New York, Chicago, DC, uh, San Francisco. 
And that report mentioned a number of cities where people are going to. Uh, some of the ones are ones you've heard about for a long time, which are like Austin and Nashville, but then a couple others that people around the country may have been surprised, notably Salt Lake City for West Coast companies moving out of California, but also Tampa Bay made the list. And so that along with the Redfin, you guys probably follow those kind of surveys are showing where people are moving. Uh, and you know, you, you all who know realtors know that their phones, they're not making it up when they say their phones are ringing off the hook with people from bigger cities wanting to move here. So we want to talk a lot about, you know, what is this Tampa Bay phenomenon, which we're also pleased to see this year, and where is that coming from? So for the panel, we're going to start with that question, really, which is, why is Tampa Bay looking so much better than other parts of the country uh, beyond some of the obvious que uh, answers I just gave, I guess? I would say, why not move here, right? Look, look at our weather today. Look at all of the great things happening in our city um, from a sports aspect, from a development aspect. I mean, we really have it all at the moment. And I, I think we were already on a upward um, growth mode. And I think that uh, the virus amplified that from people from the Northeast and um, up North moving down here. We've seen a tremendous amount of people uh, closing their businesses from the north uh, during this whole time and then taking that and bringing it down here, um, the cost of living, their rent, everything has been a lot cheaper. So uh, why not? You know, what's stopping them now? They can pick up and, and move. Yeah, I'll add to what Nicola said, you know, obviously all those things, affordability, weather, but the thing that we're really, I guess, forgetting is, uh, you know, personal income tax. Yeah, it's a it's a huge driver, and um, again, as as more and more people move down here, our amenities uh, are I think are getting better, and um, the uh, the opportunity for I heard someone describing the other day that people who, um, particularly maybe even a, an older generation, that they're contemplating moving to Florida possibly upon retirement, while they're sitting at home working, they're thinking, well, if I'm gonna retire in five years, I could be doing this in Florida. Yeah. Right. working from home. So I think those all factors come into play. Yeah, I, I agree with that as well. And, you know, I mean, we've got, we've got the water, the beaches, we've got culture and sports. Um, I mean, it's a lifestyle here that's, that's really difficult to beat. And we've been, I wouldn't say a, a well-kept secret, but a little bit of a, a under the radar community. And um, so it's good to see the, the region getting the note that, that it deserves as someone who's lived here for 30 years, as I think. It's nice to see some of our walkable enclaves that can promote having a, a, a certain sense of urban feel that you you love about the place you may be coming from, but you get a sense of it, but you can get in and out of it easier uh, than up north. I have another theory that I think that our lack of non of mass transit is actually this is the one time that uh, it's working for us uh, instead of against us in some of those regions uh, New York City where if that's your only choice to get around uh, you know I know a lot of friends that are up there that are fear you know fear to take mass transit and that's their only choice uh, so in this case we uh, it's positive that you can get to these areas uh, with other with multiple means you have a choice whether to take mass transit uh, we're going to have to look at what that means in the future for us as we have more people that requires more uh, and puts us back into that situation uh, and look at these uh, the bus rapid transit system that's coming in to emphasize, emphasize how we use those in a safe way and make people feel safe to be able to use either condition. So is um, beyond the everybody wanting to move here and live here, are you all seeing, whether it's from your work or for Tim, what the bank is looking in for lending money? I know, you know, been talking for 20 years about broadening the economy here. Is this, uh, is this continued optimism and growth a sign that there are more different kinds of options, or at least more different kinds of companies may be looking more seriously at moving here? Yeah, so I mean, we've we've got a, a a workforce 
issue that we need to be aware of here in Tampa Bay. I mean, I think it's an underestimated workforce in some ways because we've historically had that um, call center, you know, unskilled workforce badge. But, you know, we're seeing more and more companies from San Francisco, New York, open satellite offices here. There's a, there's a, a growing technology uh, hub uh, in Tampa Bay, certainly in, in St. Petersburg. So I think it has changed a lot. You've got businesses reload for a lot of the reasons we've talked about. You've also got population migration going on um, at the same time for the same reasons, but they're not necessarily correlated, but they support each other. And so the really the com complexion of this community's been transformed over the last 20, 25 years. And um, I think it's become more, a little more uh, uh, urban, a little more sophisticated perhaps, but it's also got, um, you know, it doesn't feel like um, um, Miami, nothing against Miami, but you know, people from the Midwest and from middle America are comfortable here, um, but it's also got the arts and the sophistication and um, sort of hits the sweet spot, I think. It, it'll be interesting if the, the virtual, for all those people, now that they're working virtual, they realize that if I can work virtually, I might as well work in the place I'd love to live the most. Yeah, yeah. Right? That's so good. so they're, they're directly correlated. It'll be interesting to, to follow uh, the level of going, going either back to the office or the level that virtual maintains uh, to allow these folks to truly live and work anywhere they want. That's a, and Jason, I think we're seeing more of that out of CEOs. That's a great point. I mean, you know, I've, I've been struck over the years as a banker here that, you know, you, you'll see a name or hear about someone and, oh yeah, well, he's the uh, very low key retired CEO of Boeing that lives in Tierra Verde or, or something like that. And there are more of those folks here than you realize. And so you're going to see more active CEOs re relocate here and not necessarily move the, the headquarters. Absolutely. Well, and, and Tim, you touched on it earlier too, is over this past 20, 25 years, um, look at our education systems, how they, USF has now become a major player, especially in the patent research and uh, the healthcare systems. So it's um, those kinds of opportunities that are transforming our economy. And there was a recent article, you know, that Jeff Vinny contributed in and, and again, look at all that has happened this past year, um, the negative and the positive, but the, the focus and uh, highlights that have Tampa been brought from hockey to baseball to, you know, football. A lot of people are, are seeing this. Nicole touched on it earlier. We're, we're, we have a, we have a lot to offer and that education piece is a, is a big component of that. Uh, UT in the past 20 years has probably almost tripled in size. So it's, it's an amazing, education growth as well. We've got the military here, you know, we've got the higher higher ed, we've got quite a bit of light manufacturing here that people don't realize is here. We've got the port, uh, we've got growing financial services, not just back office, more front end insurance in particular. So um, somebody, somebody uh, years ago, a banker uh, that I worked with, we worked for the same company and he was in Houston, in Texas and he was an energy banker and he was top banker every year and he he said you know tim what you need to find a horse and ride it what's the what's the horse you can ride in tampa bay he met one particular sector i said there's not really it's a diversified economy and and you know this guy doesn't have a job right now because he rode the energy horse and you know riding a diversified horse is uh riding several horses whatever you want to call it is a much better strategy than hooking your wagon to one horse i think well, um, so going back to the survey, um, it showed, this is not a big surprise, uh, when the respondents asked what sectors were looking strong and not so strong, multifamily, industrial looking strong, office and retail, not so much. Uh, do any of y'all have anything that you're seeing that uh, does not follow that narrative? Like if, if somebody was asking you what sector is kind of surprising you right now on what's coming, whether that's good or not so good, is there one that would jump out for y'all? Well, I can tell you from a retail perspective, you've got to look at it in different buckets. Uh, grocery retail, which we specialize in, is off the charts. We have got a development pipeline like no other. 
your brick and mortar uh, grocery store with small shop adjacent to it is not going away. Our retail is not dead. Um, it's very much alive and we've had some of the best quarters that we've had in the company's history. So I can, I can tell you retail is not dead from that perspective. Now there are some challenges and other aspects of retail that we've all seen and we all hear about on the day to day, but there were categories prior to this that were dying, um, sporting goods and, um, you know, appliance that was kind of taking a dip where this, uh, the virus has truly helped it. So if you look at sporting goods now, it is through the roof. If you look at someone like Best Buy who added the experiential uh, component to their store, all of these people are now starting to thrive and have had much more positive numbers. Yes, some of the malls that um, are in our, in our town um, are struggling and they're going to have to repurpose them, but maybe it's time for them to be repurposed, right? Is, it, is that where the multifamily comes in? Is that where some of our additional medical comes in? Um, you know, I think that is, retail is definitely not dead from the grocery perspective. And I think something to watch is restaurants. Um, they were obviously hit extremely hard um, during all of this. And I think you're gonna see them come out pretty strong. There's a lot of pent up demand for people wanting to gather and go to restaurants and eat out and be with their friends and be with their family again. Yes, it's going to take some additional time but you're seeing these restaurants adapt to that. Is it the outdoor seating? Is it spread out seating? Are people doing more private dining? Uh, there's a lot of different components that uh, restaurants are adapting to. I think um, this coming weekend with Valentine's Day, I will tell you, I tried to find a, a place for a reservation and everything was booked from Thursday to Monday night. So I think we're seeing some really good signs in the, in the restaurant uh, business. Uh, another one that we've been watching, um, just from a personal side, is the short-term uh, VRBO. Everyone wants to vacation here, and these things are have been like flying off the shelf. So we've been watching that a little bit. Yeah, I'll add Nicole what you talked about on the retail side. We've been it's it's been a couple of years coming now, but the big, you know, we we developed a couple of uh, scenarios called you know the mall remix. I mean, malls all have their greatest asset. They have huge amounts of real estate. Unfortunately, 60% of it's an asphalt. So the ability <laughs> to take advantage of their locations and create, you know, 18 hour communities now where you put in a parking structure and wrap it with, re wrap it with residential and create, you know, going from the mall to the main street and having that ground floor active with restaurants and food and beverage outlets and stuff and, and really redeploying the real estate asset in a different scenario. Um, I think it's becoming, we, we're seeing it, we're seeing more people looking at it. And uh, I think that's, that's a trend that's gonna happen for a while. Uh, I'll just men mention on the office for a second, the, uh, you know, since we, opened our own office building, uh, new office building two weeks ago. The, uh, you know, there is a lot of movement in the office sector. You know, there are a lot of, uh, you know, there are a lot of people moving, uh, going downsizing, shifting, reorganization, you know, so from a, a design and construction standpoint, there is a lot of, you know, redevelopment of that office space. Uh, where it's costing is the developers need, you know, they're, paying out more for build outs than they used to they're, they're, that portion of it, the more the incentives is higher. Uh, the, the lease rates haven't dipped, uh, you know, extremely, um, you know, but all of those negotiations are on the table now, but we are seeing a lot of people shifting around and restacking and relooking at what their real needs are moving forward. Kyle, I'll, I'll add one, um, you know, point on, um, so Nicole mentioned retail. And so from the bank's perspective, from a financing perspective, um, you can still get a loan on an anchored retail strip center, um, you know, pretty easily. Um, good luck. I hate to be that blunt getting one on a non-anchored retail strip center right, right now, unless you're the kind of person that doesn't really need a loan. Um, it's just, um, there's a lot of uncertainty there. And, um, the other thing is with hospitality or, you know, when we, when I say hospitality, I typically I'm talking about hotels and there's a real divergence between the performance of, you know, the downtown hotels that serve the business traveler 
uh, which aren't doing very well, and the hotels at the beach, which are booked, uh, their occupancies are as, as good or better than pre-COVID. Um, right. So that's an interesting thing to note. And, you know, you uh, pre-COVID, um, you know, you might get a hotel loan at, uh, you know, with with 25% or even 20% equity in it. Um, depending on the deal, you may, you may have to put 40% equity in it now. Right. Well, um, as far as the rest of the year, um, what, for you all, does it, is there anything that would cause you to not have anything that could happen beyond just obviously more spikes leading to more shutdowns? Anything else cause you concern as far as this rosy picture for the rest of the year? Is, is there anything else that might happen? And it's okay if there isn't, but it's like, is there anything else that might happen that would give you all concern for the rest of the year? I can tell you, I, I, I talked to our development team about this in particular, um, and I would say their biggest concerns are the construction costs, and that's, that remains a big concern of theirs. And um, some of the municipalities are still doing the work from home and the permit process has just been a lot slower and uh, more painful than what it had been in the past. And we have seen that um, continue. So I think that will still compile on top of each other as time goes by. So it'll be interesting if they end up going back into the office if that speeds up or if they're still going to be catching up or if this is going to continue to snowball okay i don't oh, want to I think, uh, uh, go ahead keith i just say i don't be want to be the one that brings it up but i guess i will um the h word i mean hurricanes i mean climate change is still a big deal here and we had one of the most active years last year uh, in the Atlantic that we've ever seen. We've, we continue to dodge the bullet here in, in the Bay Area. And um, I, I do believe there's something to our geography that, that, that assists with that, but um, that's gonna be one of, the, one of the bigger things. I know earlier you mentioned, Kyle, our involvement with ULI, and we've, we've been you know going to resiliency studies there and understanding that, but, the biggest concern I have in, in, the, in the long term is as these storms continue to hit, as our coastal areas get more and more concerning, and Tim, you might be able to add this to the financeability of our development in these areas. That's, that's one of the, the bigger concerns I think we have to look out for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think you're right. Keith, and I, I think we're just now beginning to realize that and get our hands around it. And I don't know that anybody's really effectively factoring that in. Um, I would also, um, actually there was another point I was, was going to make on, I think, you know, I think in the near term, the, um, there's going to be so much government spending, so much stimulus money, so much, you know, there'll probably be an infrastructure bill. It's going to be so much money flowing that in the near term, things will be pretty good in terms of growth relative, you know, quarter over quarter growth. Longer term, we've got a big issue to deal with in terms of the deficit. And, you know, I'm the banker. I hate to bring that up, but, you know, nobody's worried about it right now. And I think, you know, most economists would even say right now the, the risk of not spending on stimulus and infrastructure outweighs the risk of spending. But longer term, we've got some real uh, imbalances we're going to have to deal with. Yeah. Along the lines of spending, I, I think that. Um those of us that are heavily invested in you know, municipal institutional work, when you look at the overall budget decreases in our uh, local and statewide government, uh, that is going to come down uh, on limiting the number of projects and uh, the number of projects that go ahead uh, for the next next few years. So that usually takes a you know a year or two to to actually come into next year's budget where they realize that the, the lower numbers and then they'll carry that over to the following years even if the numbers are going up you know so we have a couple of years ahead of us that there's going to be some significant project cuts in the municipal zone okay good um so how how is tampa bay from you all a lot of you all all you guys do work around florida are there any advantages i think um Jason, you mentioned that 
it can be simpler living here than perhaps in Miami with its traffic issues. Does Tampa Bay have any particular advantages or disadvantages versus Orlando, Jacksonville, South Florida, other areas of the state? We're just better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We've got a little bit of everything here. I mean, well, the, the nice thing about the West Coast of Florida, and I'll compare it against the East Coast, is you know, you can still go out and find natural beach edges. You know, it's not the, um, you know, the strip from Jacksonville to Miami. It's, uh, you can go up to the, you know, the, the coast up along the coast here, all the way along the edge. There's still, and that's, that's accessible uh, to you. Uh, people in Orlando can't do that. I mean, the, the, it's a, there's a noticeable, you know, environmental difference, you know, temperature wise between Orlando and Tampa. I mean, we still get the Gulf breezes and, mm -hmm. you know, it cools down the, you know, so it's, I think those things are, it's one of those things you don't know until you, you've been here a while. And I think that's what keeps the population here strong. I don't think you can downplay either like coinciding everything that Keith just said with uh, having a, a center to communities that a, a noticeable uh, amount of the community that lives lives and works within that community has that small you know urban core yeah for you know even if it's a, a city like Dunedin uh, some of those small cities that have a, a core with it or St. Petersburg Tampa you know that it in some of those other locations, you can't find where the core of the city is, you know, or, or where that walking friendly portion of it. And, you know, they're relying uh, too much on uh, tourism in some of those zones that that leg of the stool without the place to work and the real, you know, place to, to live. And the, the multi, uh, multi legs on, on the stool here, you know, really uh, allows people to, to come for many different reasons, but I think it also really allows them to stay. They see themselves staying here, uh, which is getting our influx of actual residents. Yeah, I would agree. I think, um, you know, from, if you look at Tampa versus Orlando, Orlando also had a lot of growth, uh, residential growth as well. But what I think some of the concerns over there lie is, does the tourism fully come back? Are they going to be able to uh, hire back all of those people that were there, have those people relocated and come to what potentially we may have, which would be additional um, jobs and businesses coming to the area. So uh, I think we have a lot of positive things. We're seeing a huge amount of growth in suburbia with a lot of people not necessarily wanting to stay. Uh, I know we talked a lot about the live, work, play type settings. A lot of people are wanting to spread out a little bit right now. Um, so we're seeing some of these suburb markets, uh, if you look up off 54 in the vet, or if you look down in Riverview, I mean, you've got 26, 28 people a day before the virus moving here. Now it's even more amplified. So um, capitalizing off of that has really, we've been following these growth markets and really been strategic with putting the grocer. So I think, uh, I think it'll continue. And I think you're going to continue to see it come out from the core of Tampa and St. Pete into the suburbia. Jason, I think you should brand that, you know, West Coast of Florida, it's just better. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pretty good bumper sticker. Um, okay, so the last thing, we got some individual questions for you guys, but the last question for the group would be, as usual, third year in a row, uh, a lot of concerns about recruiting and keeping great people. Um, I know that in a couple of the news stories, I think you've mentioned it too, talking about how I think Peter had actually mentioned about obviously culture is more important than ever because it can be often hard just to um, try to keep people only based on how much you're paying them. So what are you all seeing in your respective organizations on that front? And are your organizations doing anything that the folks on the call might be able to take a, uh, an example from that's, that's working for you? Uh, I can tell you this is this was an interesting question for me because the average tenure at our company right now I am like I've only been there three years and the average tenure is 10 plus years. So we've uh, been able to retain all of uh, all of our teammates all through this I would say we haven't 
I don't think we've had anybody leave over the past year. Um, and I think, you know, creating that culture and making everybody have a sense of place. So how have we been doing it? It's either been through, um, you know, calls like this on a Zoom. Uh, we do it periodically that way. We just had a Valentine's one before this today where uh, everybody gets to participate still. Um, we do have a little bit of an advantage where we are in an office and so we can see each other a little bit more frequently um, than some people, but um, offering different incentives and groups and clubs that people can be a part of um, has really still given them a sense of place. And in particular, I can tell you from a team perspective, each of us as executives have really focused on uh, not what are you doing for me, but how are you doing? How is your family doing? What do you need from us to help your family life and make this easier? So really showing that touch and the care has, um, I think, helped in getting everybody through it. And, um, you know, there's a lot of things mentally, whether you're mom or dad or what have you, having kids in school, you know, at the beginning of the school year was rough. So being adaptable to what everybody's setting has been. Um, I think it, adapting is probably the main word we've been using uh, throughout the past probably tw you know nine months now. If I wasn't working for myself, I, I would want to work there. I, I like the, <laughs> <laughs> the uh, I, I'll, I'll echo that. Um, so there, you know, twofold, you know, working, you know, paying attention to the individual, you know, nature of the situations having flexibility the the one size does not fit all you know in this situation and i think that's maybe a uh, you know good good wake up for a lot of situations uh you know not just how we adapt to covid but maybe how we uh, you know just adapt to people in in general and their different uh positions this also touches on diversity and inclusion you know, that we should be looking through the lens of how we, you know, uh, treat everybody equal, but we also treat them as individuals. Uh, so that means they may need different uh, situations or different, uh, you know, ways of working and be accommodating for that. The other thing is believe in, they, they need something to believe in. And what is the vision of the, the company and, you know, that, um, you know, that isn't, that isn't always the, that is the bottom line. That's like what you're doing from a, a design standpoint, from a community standpoint, are you making a difference? Are they individually making a difference in this, this world that we uh, are, you know, especially love in the Tampa Bay right now and, and their fellow, fellow man, you know, so finding opportunities uh, both, uh, you know, from, you know, a charity organization, but also just everything that we do has some type of impact and really emphasizing that part of the work in design uh, has made a lot of difference to uh, the people in our company. Yeah, it, working in a larger organization, it's, it's uh, we've seen, you know, how the HR departments are really now, you know, more, much more integral to, to the employee, not just for the hiring and, and benefits needs, but working through kind of their, their, their daily, monthly, annual uh, issues, you know, flexibility in the work week. Um, we have a, a lot of people at, you know, 30 hours a week, giving them some flexibility to, to work with things like that. And then, you know, the other thing is a kind of an old fart here. I'm, I'm, I'm amazed all the time of all the other things. I mean, who knew, who knew what Yammer was? You know, if you, and that's just internal communication between people within the firm to be able, be able to express and post and, you know, so those sort of connectivity opportunities and actions taken by organizations, I think, are also helping with the uh, with the retention that, that Nicole was touching on. Kyle, I don't really have a lot to add. I mean, so banking maybe is a little different animal uh banks tend to be um perhaps a little paranoid by nature um and looking at the downside uh i mean it's kind of what we had the way we have to look at things sometimes but i mean we don't see a ton of people um making moves right now in the banking business i think there's just there's some uncertainty that sort of is making people think you know if i've got a good gig i'm going to stick with it there's fear candidly of rifts we don't have any plan but our reductions in force 
um, just because bank earnings are under pressure with interest rates as, lo as low as they are and loan demand, um, while there's a lot of development going on in the aggregate, um, you know, loan demand for operating businesses, you know, loans to finance, um, mergers, things like that are not as frequent or there are people that are still sitting on the sidelines. There's a lot of capital out there and people are sitting on the sidelines. So we're not seeing a ton of turnover. Um, my fear is that we get complacent because of that. And then when things do, uh, the uncertainty is lifted. You have an exodus because you haven't properly appreciated your employees. Sure. That makes sense. Okay, good. Um, so now we have a, a, a question for each of the panels and then we'll, anybody from the audience who wants to ask a question, we'll have you go into the chat function. So Jason, um, for your company, are you guys seeing any design trends that are interesting, whether it's pandemic related or not right now? From a design trend, I think we mentioned a little bit about the the evolution of the interior malls going to streetscapes and and turning inside out, maybe you know, redefining the asphalt. <clears throat> I think that concept is being uh, implemented in a lot of different ways. I uh, think about the convertible street uh, way of thinking, where it, it's not always a street that you're driving on. It can be converted to a pedestrian way. Uh, or some portion of that or some portion of the parking, we see our streetscapes uh, filling that outdoor dining space, the outdoor cafe space. Mm -hmm. And uh, we think of the, the peer market that we just uh, completed for the peer approach. We were a little bit ahead of the curve to open that during the pandemic. And the peer approach has been extremely successful. Uh, those market stalls being outdoor and fresh air have had uh, so much more traffic than any of your other retail locations. People feel safe, they feel open, they're shaded. Uh, and we, we can't forget that that was once a four lane highway going out to the end of the pier. So we converted a four lane highway that was really not needed into a pedestrian way that is giving retail businesses an opportunity to really grow during a pandemic. Uh, so there's discussion on Central Avenue for, for St. Petersburg of uh, convertible street options uh, and those concepts uh, happening throughout the city. Those are you know, ways of you know, expanding that uh, urban space to, to all. Uh, so I think that's gonna continue. I think people have found a, a lot of unique ways to make use of their outdoor space. A lot of restaurants that have built patios and courtyards and you know, taking advantage of that. And I don't think that's going away. I think that's going to be expanded. That's more leasable space. It's more seats. It's more opportunities that you're not paying a high rent for. Uh, so I think that businesses have figured out that that is actually going to give to their bottom line uh, and allow them to operate whether there's a pandemic or, or not in many ways. Uh, so I think the advantage of the outdoor space is, is really a fantastic one uh, that we have kind of fallen or evolved a little bit. And the idea that we take over some parking spaces for more usable pedestrian, uh, you know, I like too, as we evolve in a more urban context, you know, we go start shifting to a parking maximum instead of parking minimums, uh, you know, over time. So we're, we're not there yet, but the, you know, this is a, a step in that direction overall. Uh, other sectors, you know, when we go in, inside the building in the education sector, we're, we're seeing some of the spaces that have to, you know, think of, you know, spacing or non-spacing, flexibility and seating, flexibility in spaces. If a space can open to a, another space or corridor that if they have the opportunity to keep a ratio of students to teachers in a larger space, uh, that's forcing us to rethink uh, a lot of those educational spaces with those ratios that are required. So uh, something has to give. You either have a space for a classroom or you have a you know, number of students you know, with a teacher. Uh, so that's really af affecting how we think about some of those spaces. But I think in the long run can be good if our educational spaces are more flexible and allow f to accommodate different learning and education modalities uh, to occur. So, you know, to think about some of these these things as maybe uh, we've pivoted in a very quick way and because we had to, but I think there's a lot of advantages on the backside for how 
design and and can take advantage of spaces forgotten and maybe uh, evolve some spaces types of spaces that haven't evolved in many years because they haven't had to good um nicole your uh my question for you, you answered really well earlier about how retail is doing but as a follow-up to that um, been reading some things around the country where parts of malls are being converted to distribution centers. Um, what is the, is it, I know it's hard to tell right now, but what is the lasting impact? Certainly more and more, it's no secret, more and more people are using Amazon every day for ordering, but post pandemic, what do you all see that looking like? Um, and it, it, will you be seeing areas in this, Tampa Bay area perhaps converted to things like distribution centers? Yeah, so I will say, you know, we get this question a lot from the grocery sector with online groceries. And will that, uh, you know, will it ruin the brick and mortar? Will the footprint of your grocery store change? And I think you've seen over the past little bit, yes, it has changed the footprint of your grocery store, but you still will have the grocery store. People are still gonna wanna go in there um, to go by, you know, pop in, they grab their you know, pharmaceuticals, pop in to grab milk, things like that. Um, but what you've seen is kind of the transition to the pickup, uh, the pickup stalls, the pickup at the front for your ship shopper and things like that. Um, will they do a larger back of the house or a separate area for uh, the online? I don't know. We have not seen that type of footprint come out yet. Um, and, you know, changing some of these malls into more distribution centers, I think you may see a little bit of it. They're definitely be repurposing into uh, a lot of medical. We've seen that uh, really take off. Um, but the distribution part, I'm still a little bit, uh, I don't know. That is, I'm not 100% sure where that's going to go. There's a lot of that last mile uh, right. stuff happening right now and have been. And it's been a topic of conversation for all of these years. Um, so it's, it's interesting to see, but what I can say from a design perspective to touch a little bit on Jason's stuff is, uh, anytime you can create something with convenience, we were already heading this direction, um, from the grocery, from the grocery side, uh, with the pickup spots. And if you can add drive throughs to any type of your building, I mean, and making large sidewalks, these are things that we're having conversations with our designers right now. Um, we have to account for that outdoor seating covered outdoor seating. We have to account for the drive-throughs and, and mm -hmm. many locations as the grocery would allow us to have. And, um, and having those, where before we would try to stay away from dedicated parking, we've had to go to some dedicated parking spots because people like Panera and Chipotle um, have to have that because that has been you know huge percentages of their business. And that remains a huge percentage of their business. So uh, from that perspective, we're looking at from at the design of how these um, businesses are doing. I'll tell you, we've been in the middle of design with both Panera and Chipotle, and from when we started to now, it has evolved. So um, they're really trying to turn on a dime um, to to make those adapt, you know, make adaptions to their layouts as well. Okay, good. Um... Tim, as far as lending, you mentioned that certainly getting a hotel loan is going to require a lot more collateral. Uh, anything else that the folks on this call who might be working with companies that are looking to grow and looking to get financing, um, are, you said a lot of capitals on the sidelines. What are they waiting for? Well, um, that's a good question. I mean, I think, um, I think that, you know, Capital doesn't like uncertainty. So mm -hmm. um, I think as we see, um, and, and you know, the stock market doesn't like uncertainty as we see, um, you know, vaccinations rolled out and infection rates come down. I think we'll see a lot of this hopefully um, solve itself. But yeah, there's a lot of capital out there. Um, so banks are flush with, with cash right now. Um, you know, people have been saving more, um, you know, in part because they um, they don't go out as much, some of it intentionally, you know, sort of saving for the rainy day that we think is coming or is already here. So banks have more deposits sitting on their balance sheets um, than they did. Our um, loan to deposit ratios are lower. So we've got these deposits that we're paying clients to keep in the bank with us, probably not paying as much as they'd like, um, that we're not lending out as much, 
you know, we're, we've got Hancock Whitney's got two and a half billion dollars invested or not invested sitting with the Federal Reserve earning uh, 0.02% right now. So we'd rather put that money to work in good uh, earning assets and loans. You've got, you know, investors that might um, might be comfortable, have historically been comfortable with the stock market as the stock market rises, I think, uh, has risen. There's been more volatility. You know, real estate represents um, a good long term uh, it perceived safer uh, investment. So there is a ton of um, a ton of capital out there. I think we've just got to get some of this in uncertainty behind us. And in terms of how the banks have, have changed their approach, I mean, we're very much looking to make good loans. I mean, if you've got a really solid deal, um, you know, um, you can get a better rate right now than you could have a year ago. Okay. Um, on the other hand, if you've got a, a, a deal, so, so if you've got a, a deal for a medical office, space. You can probably get a better deal right now than you could have a year ago. If you've got a strip center, um, maybe anchored you can, but if you've got a non-anchored strip center, um, good luck. It's just, so things have changed. So, you know, sing, multifamily is still going strong. Um, single family home builders are doing really well. Um, uh, you know, I think I saw where um, uh, Lakewood Ranch is, um, uh, we've got three of the top five, um, you know, of those type of communities in the country right here in Florida between the villages and um, Lakewood Ranch. And, and there's another one down in Southwest Florida. Well in um, Park. Yeah. Yeah. We, right. Yeah, right. Well exactly. Park is, yeah. Oh. They're the top, the top fastest growing multi plant or yeah. planned communities in the country. So yeah. it's and not, selling it's not, over 100, 100 homes a month. Yeah. They're averaging like 112 uh, to 120 a month. So it's not just multifamily, the single family is doing really well industrial warehouse space uh you know because of distribution and sure. the need for that uh, that's on fire right now and we're aggressive in that space we're senior senior housing is still pretty active uh, believe it or not um you know the hospitality and the hotels again it's a little more difficult um uh, so you've got the property types and you're going to see historically you might have seen more 75 ish 80 percent advance rate regardless of property type now you're seeing a bigger divergence uh, in the loan loan to cost or loan to values that the banks will do depending on property type. Right. Um, you know, if it's uh, something that relies on leasing income, you know, more pre-leasing is going to be required, at least 50% pre-leasing, very little spec uh, income producing where you sort of build it because you think the demand's there and you don't have pre-leases. Um, you know, we're asking our clients to do, we, we do a COVID-19 assessment for every every borrower now. It's part of the write-up package. And um, and we also want to understand their sort of go forward strategy for, for dealing with it, you know, from PPE costs to, you know, employee health care and testing costs. And so it's it's pretty interesting how big of a section of the write-up uh, on, a, on a credit package that is um, these days. So, um, but we're still, you know, we I've got a big loan growth goal this year, and we've got bankers with big loan growth goals, and we're out there trying to. We've just got to make the right kind of loans that don't, because you know, banks banks lend money and make a two or three percent margin. Not there aren't that many industries where you have to make a living with a two or three percent margin, and so you can't afford to be wrong very often as a bank. So um, we we got to put the money where where we think it's gonna um, where they're gonna be able to pay us back, and uh, that's what we're trying to do. Okay, good. And then a final um, individual question for Keith. I know that Stantec is part of a group, um, a number of planning groups, uh, design groups that are in the mix for a possible redevelopment for the Tropicana Field property in St. Petersburg. Um, from a planning design point of view, I know by now you've seen the other proposals. Any commonalities you're seeing and also, I guess, uh, I guess challenges for this project in particular, uh, certainly the city, I think rightly so is saying this has to, project has to have a huge element of honoring the community and listening to the community and remembering that neighborhoods were torn out to even create Tropicana Field. So what are you seeing in that respect? Well, obviously it's a, this is the, a true urban infill, redivided at an incredible scale. Uh, but it's also the, you know, the convergence of, you know, opportunity, need, and and real estate. And you know, 
the scale of development is, you know, you, you see the, the DC yards and, and here in our own backyard what, what uh, SPP is doing with Water Street, those opportunities are, are here and they're real and, they, and people can see those come to fruition. Um, we have, you know, most of the schemes and obviously you're taking advantage of the, the huge natural resource of Booker Creek. And how does that become, you know, an embellished opportunity for outdoor space and recreation um, in a much needed uh, portion of town, even though it's, you know, not that far from, you know, from the waterfront and, uh, you know, the, the pier, but it's still, it can serve a much greater community there. And, you know, the opportunity to really, uh, and I look at it as an opportunity as well as a challenge, but an opportunity for the diversity and the inclusion and, and equity that's that's going to be necessary there because that's how a true development and economy works when you have that diversification. Um, I think again one of the convergence I, I talked about is someone touched on it earlier is the you know the the reinvestment in infrastructure uh, that the federal government's going to be making and the opportunity to rethink the 175 corridor and knitting back that, you know, the Campbell Park and the Rose Park in the, the southern uh, portion of the community and bringing them back to life uh, because they are vibrant communities. And how do we begin to now merge this all together? You know, the districts around the TROP site are, are well and strong and growing and that needs to encompass the entire uh, 360 degrees around this property. Um, we've got the innovation district, you know, that now touches it. Um, so, you know, I think all the, you know, talked about as I looked at them all, they all recognize that. So the question is, is how do you, how do you deploy uh, your team to merge and, and meld with the greater community and really have that conversation and they're a part of the process as opposed to told what the process is and, and how we work that in. We remember our past and our history and bring back what was really a, a, a thriving community uh, before those incidents of the interstate and the Tropicana came about. So um, it's, they're, they're all challenges when you're working with 86 acres, of course there's gonna be challenges, but mm -hmm. that's the real opportunity as well and understanding those communities' needs with mergings with the, with the, uh, with the economy uh, that's happening and the growth that we're, we've all were talking about earlier in this, in, this, uh, in this area, pulling all those together so everybody gets a piece, piece of the pie and a, a seat at the table. Okay, good. Um, we have a question from the audience about, if you all are following this, the Tampa City Council recently considered a moratorium on apartment development in some parts of the city. Um, what are the ramifications of, of a moratorium on building more apartments? Is this a, a sign that maybe, um, you know, we always talk about services keeping up with growth, but have you all, any of you all been following that? Any thoughts on that? Uh, I, I've been following that. Um, the, I mean, that's, that's a particular, particular region, you know, particular area that's, uh, yeah, claiming the infrastructure, the you know, streets and traffic aren't keeping up with the, the numbers of residential units. It's certainly, um, it's certainly, a, you know, a need, you know, but uh, taking away people's rights for a year or, or more or potentially indefinite to develop their property with, with given zoning rights is really a dangerous slope. Uh, so, you know, I, I agree the discussions, but it's it's really if uh, so governments the the government needs to address their infrastructure and you know with the the tip fees that they're charging all of these developers to implement and figure out a way to do it faster. Uh, but you know, mor uh, moratoriums and and you know if you go to a you know what St. Pete Beach did a few years ago where they you know went to a full referendum for every type of similar change uh it stifles and kills communities and kills the organic you know growth as well so it doesn't just hurt those big developers with the you know it hurts every 
uh, owner of a, a property in that district. So I, I don't think that's the correct you know, way to uh, address a, a, an issue. I mean, I think you bring those people to the table, you, you look at technology, you look at all the ways that you can address those infrastructure needs and, and have more discussions with it. But uh, moratorium is a, a dangerous slope, in my opinion. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with kind of everything Jason touched on that. It's, you know, what we do as a profession, it's, it's problem solving, you know? So, you know, understanding the problem, uh, using the tools that are at your disposal, uh, technology is changing at such a fast rate. Um, you know, you touched on, you know, traffic and, and, and parking and, and those are, those are evolutional, um, issues that have been around for a while, but I think we're going to see those. I think people are, are mobility issues and micro mobility is becoming more and more of a, uh, an opportunity to assist with some of these decisions, but, uh, but to put a moratorium on development is, you know, uh, it's killing the golden goose. Uh, we just can't do that. We've got to continue to look forward, uh, work through these issues. Um, we're, we're growing urban center and how do we how do we attack those problems and not try to push them underneath the sweep them underneath the rug and wait for them to go away because they won't and if they do that is bad that's a big problem okay um i think we um peter and don i think we are we out of time is there um do we have any more questions anybody else want to send a chat i guess i should ask we're out of time first <laughs> Yeah, we're at 630, so. Okay, that's a, that worked out pretty nicely. Yeah. Uh, well, panelists, thank you so much for being so engaging and keeping your Zoom audience awake. That was a good job. <laughs> we don't know. They're all, they're all they're trying sharing screens. They it's hard to know. Or they may be asleep. <laughs> but uh, thank you all for your time. I think uh, hopefully everybody learned a few things they didn't already know. So thanks. Thank you, thanks, guys. Joseph, Joseph Walter, yes. Yes, thanks, everybody, for joining us. And thanks mm -hmm. especially to all of you who took part in the panel.